even begin to, to prick and open our hearts that we're open and receptive of your message today. In your holy name I pray. Amen. If you would, stand with me as we continue to worship and sing the wonderful cross. somebody's neck it is where though beauty and tragedy all happen at the exact same time there's a song that's called the wonderful terrible cross it's because of what it meant and it should mean to each of us because every time we see it we should be reminded of what somebody did for us I've told you the story before of how my father saved my life when I was about eight years old, about how a dog jumped at the throat and 
he attacked just out of nowhere. And my dad reached over and grabbed me. Well, I'm forever indebted to my father because of what he did for me that day as a little boy, as he would have because, well, I'm his son and he's my father. Can you imagine what God had to do when he sacrificed his son for me, for you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, I thank you for the wonderful yet terrible cross. Every time we see it, we should be reminded of what it meant to each and every one of us. How we should be forever indebted to you as we are. And as Christians, we recognize what it means. But Lord, for the world, it has just become another thing. It even becomes offensive for some. Lord, I pray that every single time someone will see it, though, they will just take a moment to reflect what it meant and what it cost you for each and every one of us. So, Lord, today we find you worthy of our worship because of what you did for us, because the cross is not the last word. It is finished is not the last word, because you then at that moment, though you finished it, you were really just beginning. And you came up out of that grave. If you were just dead, then none of this would matter. But because you're alive, we can celebrate today. So, Lord, I pray that you take this worship that is happening behind me with these ladies and gentlemen that are on this platform and the ones that are in front of me, the congregation of the Delville Baptist Church. And, Lord, I pray that you're pleased with it. I pray, Lord, that you are even as much satisfied with our worship. And if anything that is played, sung, read, proclaimed, preached, that is done outside of your will, Lord, I pray that you forgive us for it and you put us, our eyes right back on you where they belong. And Lord, I say all these things and pray them, ask them in the wonderful, powerful, perfect name that is in above every name, the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. It is so good to see you in God's house today. We have a wonderful turnout today. And even more coming in, and we are welcome to each of you on Facebook that have joined us today to be a part of this worship service here at the Daleville Baptist Church. Well, it's been a very interesting week, I know. I reference uh, Dr. Stamps, and we have had a, uh, with pretty much not a lot of incident as the first day of school. So for those of you that made it, congratulations. Some of you, your senior year has begun. And let's hope it goes all the way through then. And so I just recognize that, knowing that I called your name Friday night and some others. And so it has been a great weekend. And I hope and pray you get a little rest and look forward to go back to a little bit of normal this hopefully this next week. Now, among the, t among the meantime, y'all know that it's that time of year between August and November. It's hurricane season. I think there's going to be probably two more that might show up on the Gulf Coast before it's over with. But we want to take a moment to recognize those people in Louisiana and Texas that have lost and are continuing to just to try to recover from what we dealt with over the past few days. And so I want to remind you of that. And thank you for all of you that have just been here and are a part of this this morning. For our guests, we are glad you're here. Ace is making his presence known this morning. So we're glad that he's here this morning. And for the rest of you, we are so glad that you have chosen to join us in worship, whether in person or virtually, uh, here at the Daleville Baptist Church. Well, I'm not going to stop any more worship. So I'm going to ask if you would to stand with us. I've got some other announcements we're going to give at the end today. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand as Christian and our team lead us in worship this morning.
may be seated this morning. Great job, team. Thank you very much. As they are moving back into their place, it is time for Children's Church. And uh, they are moving into place also. Miss Darby is ready for you guys. And I hope you have a great time at Children's Church today. They're going to have almost as good a time as we're going to have in here. All right. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word this morning, I ask you to turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 13 today. Right after church this morning, we're going to let you guys know that we had uh, your Sunday school material. Those of you that are filling in and going through the books, we have those available for you. And so right at the end of the service today, we're going to have those available at this corner. Somehow or another, we're going to secretly get those to there to where we can have those for you able to be picked up. And I've given a secret signal to certain youth minister who's going to take care of that as this service concludes today and he's going to get the where they are from Miss Benita, the Sunday school directors, and she will somehow get that done and nobody's going to know that's going to even take place. It's going to be magical how that works out. <laughs> I want to thank each and every again for being here today. It's been a great day so far. It's been a wonderful week. Um, I want to thank you to each and every one of you who participated this past Wednesday night in our prayer walk through the schools, whether you were in person or you did it at your own home. Um, I will speak on behalf of the superintendent who has and, and told me to do so. She thanks you and you will never know how much they and the teachers appreciate what you did and what we were able to be a part of. And I thank you for allowing us to do that along with Mr. Mitten and Mr. Robertson and Dr. Irwin for allowing us to come into those schools. They are very appreciative and it's uh, day one went off with, it went off. <laughs> And so day two will start tomorrow, as we've already mentioned, and we want to continue to lift them up in prayer this year. That leads me to where we want to go today with the subject matter that we've been looking at since the beginning of our return to the service. We have been dealing with godly friendship and looking at it because I felt like and what God was leading me to do is we need God. We need godly friends right now as much as any other time we need. We've looked at it from the perspective of the Good Samaritan, David's mighty men, David and Jonathan, Lazarus and Jesus, and Ruth and Naomi. We learned last week through a very relevant and obviously up-to-date reference from the, Good, from the Lone Ranger uh, just how important godly friends are because two are better than one. Because if they have good reward then for their labor, if they fall, they're going to have a companion to pick them up and therefore he's not alone when he falls if two are together they will keep warm because they can't be warm alone though one may overpower another two can withstand him but we learned that a threefold cord is not quickly broken we want people that we can count on people to come along beside us so that our reward will be good so our help will be there our warmth will be there we can withstand and it is a great example and to look at it from the perspective, a lot of times we look in, mar in, 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 in weddings, even though it has nothing to do with a wedding. It has everything to do with godly friendship. But not every example in God's word is a godly example of what it takes to be a friend. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at the effects of a particular friendship today that changed lives in a catastrophic way. Matter of fact, it's, this particular chapter is 39 verses, but I can narrow it down into one short four-word displaced way. I'm going to say it as a sentence, even though it was taken out of the middle of the sentence. Now, I say that from the perspective of this. You're not really supposed to do that a lot of times, although some sentences stand alone. John 3.16, for instance, it is a sentence that we know encompasses the Bible. It encompasses God's word. You can take it out, and you're never taking it out of context. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It tells us and encompasses the Bible in that one sentence and God's love and everything that Jesus is. 
But I'm going to tell you this morning four words that though I'm going to leave a little bit of drama, if you don't know the encounter of what we're talking about in the Bible, and you're going to learn about it today, but I think you're going to tell by the tone that I'm going to tell you that Amnon had a friend. Now in just a minute, you're going to learn exactly who Amnon is. This is a message that is timely because school, school did start over the past month. For here in Daleville, it started this past Friday. And for you in particular, the young people of this church, whether you are online or in person, I want to ask you to listen very carefully today. And for your parents and your grandparents, because you better know who your friends and your children's and your grandchildren's friends are. All because Amnon had a friend. Chapter 13 of the book of 2 Samuel reads this way from the first five verses. After this, now what this is, is the sin of David with Bathsheba and the calling out of Nathan the prophet, telling him he is the man and the losing of a son and a fourfold promise that David declared on himself that was going to happen. And this is tick number one. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shalom, Sh 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 Shalom David's brother. Now Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? And he said one of the most sickest, vilest things that I can read in the Bible. I love Tamar, my brother's Absalom's sister. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of background so you understand what we're dealing with here. Amnon is David's oldest son. His brother is, Am, is Absalom. His sister is Tamar through another mother. You may know this. David had eight wives. Now, this is another message for another day. But he had eight. He's not Solomon, the son, which apparently did not get too, fall, too far from the tree. But again, another message for another day. Amnon was the son of Ahioam. I believe I said that correctly. I don't know if I did or not, but we're going to move forward. But his half-brother and his sister were Absalom and Tamar, whose mother was Maacah, who also they were half-brother and sister to Amnon. So we have a situation where a young man, for whatever reason, wants something and someone he is forbidden to have by the law of Moses. Leviticus 18 tells us it is forbidden for you to be a part of any type of incestual relationship, which is what this would be, even though it is not directly his blood sister. Besides the fact that it was gross then and it's gross now. And I gross is not even the right word. It's sick. It's vile. It's sinful. It's wrong. But Amnon had a friend. His name was Jonadab. Jonadab was actually his cousin. He was David's nephew. So it's a friend that would be around. It's not somebody that he met on the side of the road. It's not somebody that he met by happenstance or at the, at the fin or something. It was somebody that they would know. It was somebody that they were, would have to be around. He was his relation. He was his cousin. And the description that is given in the book of Samuel of Jonadab is going to give away with something that they knew. They all knew. Because Samuel, as he wrote this in his description of him, gave him a word that I want you to pay, pay close attention to. It is in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, or excuse me, chapter 13, verse 3. It says, now Jonadab was a very crafty man. Now that word crafty, I don't know if you recognize it or not, but it has come from a very specific place. You can look at different versions. Bobby, your version, if you have the King James, it might say subtle man. If you look in the Holman, it might say a crafty or it might say a cunning man. It might say more crafty. You might hear something, but the particular word that you're looking for there is found, first of all, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 in the description of the serpent. So their family knew all about Jonadab. They knew what he was about. They knew how he thought. They knew, and none of this should have surprised them, but nonetheless, Amnon had a friend. Now, I imagine that whenever they were to talk about Jonadab when they found the family, 
You got people that are around there and they would talk about it because they knew, especially if he had Satan's attributes, I think they would know about it. But nonetheless, he was their friend. He was their family. He was there. I mean, we all have them. People in our lives that we're friends with, that they're the you know how they are friend. I mean, you know how they are. We go ahead and make the excuse for them about who they are. Now, they're not exactly maybe our best friend, but they don't exactly either have the attribute as it would say in Colossians 3.17, and everything you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through them. Amnon had a friend like that, yet the opposite. He wasn't that friend. And the thing is, is I'm afraid we all probably have those friends, if we're honest. Amnon had a friend like this, and an influence like this, and his advice did not point Amnon to righteousness, it pointed it to selfishness. Everything that we have done so far, when you walked in today, you saw the sign up front. If you've driven by it here in town, you've seen it. It's been up for about a month now. Proverbs 18, 24. A man that has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is the verse we have used to define, to describe, and to show the difference and the similarities of what God would call a true friend. We learn and emphasize even more that this verse is about Jesus. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. But we need godly people that we can on. We need it more than it ever, but we all have those friends that don't stick closer than a brother. As a matter of fact, when you get down to the nitty gritty of what took place here, Jonadab is nowhere to be found other than this one particular moment. He's gone. I wonder why. And what you have is one of the most vile, most disgusting things you're ever going to read in God's Word. There's no one in this room that's going to argue with me that this is not a disgusting thing that you're going to do. And I'm giving you the end before we get to it. But the problem with all of this is because Amnon had a friend. So I got a question for you today, church, before we get started. Ms. Christian has given me a little more time today than I normally have. Let me ask you point blank. Do you have friends like this? Or better said, are you this friend? All because Amnon had a friend is what we're going to look at today about how it changed everything. It starts out with what Amnon heard. Now we pick this up in verse 5. And I'm going to read a little bit for you here so you know exactly what took place. We are going to talk about the act that took place, but we're not going to dwell on the act. So I want you, those of you that are concerned about what we're going to deal with, I'm going to be very delicate in what we talk about here for the younger years in the room. I'm very glad that the New King James puts this in the way that it did so it does not get into a, a more descriptive way of describing it. But I think you're going to understand, and I'll let you as parents deal with that with what this took place here. Starting in verse 5, the Bible says what Amnon heard. So Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, please tell him, let my sister Tamar come and give me food. And prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Amnon laid down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat from her hand. David had no idea what's going on, so David sent Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. Tamar wouldn't know any different, so she went to her brother Amnon's house, and there he was lying down. She took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes, and she took the pan and placed it out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring me the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into Amnon, her brother, in the, in the bedroom. And when she had brought them into her, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. Amnon heard, unfortunately, what he wanted to hear because Jonadab said words that he shouldn't have said flat out. I mean, nothing that John, Jonadab said would have been what should have been what he heard. I mean, there was no chastisement as there should have been. There wasn't somebody looking at him saying, what do you think you're doing? There's nobody looking him in the eye and saying, you know this is wrong. You know what the, the, the law says. You're the king's son. 
son, my George, and you're in a position of knowing that you could be out with any person on this earth, and you're deciding to do this, what in the world do you think they're doing? Now that's what should come out of his mouth. Somebody to come along and look you in the eye and say a word that we don't like to say much anymore for some reason. You need to repent and you need to get on your knees before God and do the right thing. But that's not what he said. Because Amnon had a friend that told him to do what a lot of people, unfortunately, tell them to do. Now, the act is not what I'm talking about. But what we do is we have become a society that softens stuff. To where what they should be doing, we tell them things like this. Well, listen, this is, this is no big deal. I mean, look, it is a little drink. It is one time. It is not going to hurt you. Everybody has done this. Quit being a goody-goody. I'm not going to tell anybody. Nobody has to know this. Let's do this one time. We're going to just have a little bit of fun. It's just no big deal. I mean, that's the way he made it into this is one of the most disgusting things that could possibly be done. And it turns out nothing is not nothing after all. It never is. He didn't tell him what he should have told him. He told him what he wanted to hear. And for one moment in time, Jonadab, was no friend to Amnon, but Amnon heard everything Jonadab said. Then it turns from there to what Amnon did. Verse 12 says, she answered, No, no, my brother, don't force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where can I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Just speak to the king. Maybe he won't withhold me from you. She even made it into a thing right there. She compromised when she should have stuck her guns. But verse 14 says, however, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. I mean, you can see this coming, can't you? Jonadab gives him suggestion because he is sick. From this that he's put in his mind over and over and over. Every time he sees Tamar go by, he has more and more lust for her. And they use the word love in the New King James, but we know good and well it's not love. It is something that is sick. It is something that is vile. It has been put into his mind. And when he did this, it is mentioned in such a way to where this no big deal suddenly comes to a place where you know what you can. And that's exactly what Amnon did. Jonadab opened the door and Amnon went running into it. Amnon had a friend. Now I want everybody to listen to me very carefully here. This friend is not mentioned anymore in this particular account. He's gone. But it is not, I repeat, it is not Jonadab's fault. That Amnon did this. Amnon made the decision. Amnon had a friend. But the, the choice that he made. And what he knew between the difference between right and wrong. Is he knew. He knew what the law said. He knew what his sister said. He knew what everybody else would say. But he did not care. And he understood and knows it. But let me remind you. Because we have a world that likes to blame other people. For our own sin. See, the verse says all the sin and fall short of the glory of God. It does not say all the sin and fall short of the glory of God because they listen to their friend and their friend will take the punishment for their sin. You are not going to get to heaven, look Jesus in the face and say, but I have a friend. It will not work. It will not work for your salvation. It will not work for punishment. It will not work for a place to be able to come back and say to put the blame on somebody else. Amnon chose to do this. And the consequences, ladies and gentlemen, they were catastrophic. But it all started with a friend. See, verse 3, you begin to see how not only Amnon changed, but everybody changed. Now, I want to remind you, let's not miss this. This is not Nebuchadnezzar. This is not Belshazzar. This is not heathen kings. This is David, his family. 
This is the man after God's own heart. So to say this won't happen to me, it happened to David. The Bible says, then Amnon hated her exceedingly. So that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he loved her. This makes me want to go into time and punch Amnon in the face. But can't you see it? This is disgusting. But he wanted something so badly. But now he hates her. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and read for, into my notes. The, the, the words that are used here, it is described in such a way as the, uh, the contempt with which Amnon had for Tamar was so severe, it is described as tone one might use in speaking of dumping trash. That's what he thought of her now. And he blamed her. Look, he told her to get out of here. Arise, be gone. Look at verse 16. So she said to him, no, this evil of sending me away is worse than... Than what you did to me. But he wouldn't listen to her. He called his servants who attended him and said, Put this woman out, away from me, and bolt the door behind her. Verse 18 says, She put on a, a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel, and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. So Amnon goes from love to hate. It's beyond hate. It's more than that. He goes from wanting to be with now to not even wanting to be in your sight. He went from listening to her voice, wanting to listen to her, do something, make cakes for me. And so now he doesn't want to listen to her. I don't want to hear you at all. He gets to a place where now he is no longer in love with her. But he has a hatred for her more than any other person on the face of the planet. You know, we use search, certain search, let me get it right. We use certain terms in describing how we feel about one another in this world. We use the term in love. And we'll use things like the heart wants what the heart wants. Let me tell you all something. The heart is wicked. Our hearts are wicked because we were born into sin and it makes us change. Because he got what he wanted. He got what his heart wanted. But then it only did that. It changed Tamar too. Look at verse 19. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore a robe of many colors that was on her. Laid her hand on her head and went out crying bitterly. Her brother changed. Look at Absalom. Look at verse 20. Absalom said to her brother, has Amnon your brother been with you? Now how would he know that? How is that the first thing he's got? Because he knew what Jonadab was like and he knew in the back of his mind what Amnon thought in his mind. They knew it, but they didn't do anything about it. The Bible continues to say that David became very angry of these things, but he didn't do one thing. This is the father. Do y'all have any idea what I would do? I better stop right there because I'm on Facebook and I'm in front of a bunch of people. Because that's my flesh talking. Because I get angry at this particular thing. That's my children. And I say that to, to halfway get you to perk up because we have to think about it. When this change takes place, it changes. It. Listen, this has become the epitome of dysfunctional. In the Middle East... What she did was she began, she tore her robe off and she put ashes on her head. It is a sign of mourning among the Middle East. She lost her virginity. She lost her prospect of being married. She lost her prospect of having children. She lost the prospect of having family. She might as well have been dead. That's why it was bad. That's why it was worse than what he did. And Absalom then plotted for two years of how he was going to kill his brother. And he did it. If you read the rest of this chapter, you read the way that this family crumbled apart. It all started because Amnon had a friend. Now I want you to think about that fear as I get to the end today. Because this friendship influenced him in such a way that changed 
a lot of lives. It changed his sister's life. It changed his brother's life. It changed his father's life. And it changed his own life. And the friend, he went on being crafty. Amnon made a decision that we read about today because his friend told him what he wanted to hear. And that is all it took. Jonadab discouraged, or excuse me, encouraged when he should have discouraged. Jonadab showed a way that would be way in instead of a way out. Amnon had a friend. And this particular chapter, it's one of those that you're probably supposed to avoid when you get to reading. But you can't. Because this happened under the God, one of the ghost godly men that God, he said, this is a man after my own heart. Now I want everybody to make sure you're paying attention here because you don't want to miss this. I want to ask you something. Do your friends, and I don't care if you're from the youngest to the oldest, do you have friends that, well, the best description I have is what we've done from the beginning. Do they pull you down or do they are part of pulling you up? When you're around them, do they influence you or do you influence them? Are they part of what's good? Are they part of what's righteous? Are they kind? Do they lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake? Do they help you grow? Do they forgive? Do they influence? Do they check on you? Do they call you out? Do they, are they people that are willing to get in your face if necessary? Are you someone who is a friend? Or do you have a friend? You see, it's real easy to say this and then walk away from this pulpit and come down to this particular aisle down here and be able to say some of the things that we've been saying because we get to this end right here and you know what's coming. You know that there's a point where we have to make a decision in this service today. And in a time of pandemic, it's really hard to get people to come to the aisle or talk to the pastor today. But this is not a decision necessarily, even though salvation is always open. Because there's a friend that you will never, ever turn away from whose name is Jesus. But this is about being a friend and having friends in our lives. And this means making a decision maybe to no longer have that friend. Because if you've got a friend in your life that does these things to you, for the gym, they would never know. I'm not talking about the act. I'm talking about being in a position where you and I know that they influence you in a way not godly. I'm going to say something today that I shouldn't say every week. Parents, you better know who your children's friends are. When my child puts on a headset to play a video game online, I better know as his father or her father who's on the other side who he's talking to. And I do. And when I don't, guess what happens? Trey gets in trouble. And he doesn't play. Whenever my child picks up her telephone or his telephone to text somebody that is on the other side, I better know where those texts are going. Because I'm a father. Not because I don't like her friends. Now, it's really easy for me to do this because I got two kids sitting here in one college and they know how I feel about this because we talk about it often. But how often is it to where you pick up the phone and the person on the other line, you don't tell your parents about it, you know, people. Now I'm staring at y'all, I'm staring at all right through you. People on Facebook, they think I, it's unfair sometimes because you're not the only ones in the room. Because I don't necessarily have to blame y'all, I can blame your parents. Because if they don't know and they don't care, it's as much your fault, but it is theirs too. Now I say that talking to y'all, but you're the one that can say this. Jonah Dad did not make the decision for Amnon. Amnon made the decision of who his friend was. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you are six or sixty. I don't care if you are brand new to really not brand new. We've all got friends. And there's people that we know
know, we look at and say, well, Brother Jim, what if we can lead them to Jesus? Then I am all for it. But what are you doing to lead them to Jesus? Are they leading you or are you leading them? Because birds of a feather, what do they do? They flock together. Are you guilty by association? Look, I'm way away from notes. This ain't got anything to do with notes. This got everything to do with me as a father. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. I gotta make sure because I'm responsible for three people beyond my house. I'm responsible for Jane, Alex, and Trey. Because my, my wife, she's responsible for those same three. And I want my name, I want my responsibility to be on them. And if whenever it does not happen, then who's it reflect back on? Why? Because that's the way that it should be. Because I need to know if Alex or Trey or Jane have a friend. I'm going to take a step further. Why? Because i got to take one of them. <laughs> Young people. Young people. When you begin to date somebody, because you don't have a friend there, I'm going to say, you're going to say, this is the way it used to be. I don't know if it's right or I love you. No, I love you. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Okay. <laughs> and you hang up. No, I didn't hang up. And you hang up. We all do that. You don't know why? Listen, I was in I was in Cockwood, Alabama, as often as I could be there. Because that's where the native was. I was going. I lived in Ozark. Do you know how much gas was back in 1996? More than ever. Guess where I would go when I was going to Benita's house? Because she built me up. I wanted to spend my time with her. I loved her. I still do. But let me tell you something. If you're a friend, then that time spent is worth something, not something where eventually you're going to be. I'm looking at parents and grandparents in this room, and I'm done today. At the end of the day, you don't want the excuse that is given as well, he had a friend. That's how every person that is an alcoholic probably starts. That's probably every person that is now on the street corner somewhere started. It's because they got a friend. I'm going to ask you about you as a first job. This is a very real, very raw message. Wherever you are in the world, I'm asking about you and some close your eyes. Here's your invitation today. Two parts. Number one, do you have a friend? You need to start just praying for them. Because they need Jesus, obviously. But they may be influencing you in such a way where you have to step away. That may be the hardest decision you've ever made, but you know it. Their family knew it about Jonadab. Or else Absalom would have said nothing. He wouldn't have known. They made a decision to not do anything about it. They didn't take away his influence. They weren't parents. You need to be a friend to your children or your grandchildren or your whoever they may be. And maybe take away the phone. Check the texts. Be somebody that whether at the end of the day they like it or they don't like it. No, because you're their parent. You're not their friend. Now yes, you can be their friend. But I wanted my daddy to be my dad. Not my friend. So you need to be that. Do you have those friends? Do your children have those friends? Second, are you that friend? Now, we're all friends of somebody. Do you build up or do you tear down? You're the only one that can answer. If you find yourself as a person who tears down, here's what you do. Repent. Come to Jesus. by setting an example worth following. Be the man or woman they think you are or they need you to be. Be a friend, a real friend, by taking one
one step towards the Savior, my friend, and having his arms open wide because he is a friend that will stick closer than a brother to you and he will walk you through this. If you need me as your pastor, I'm going to be right here. We're going to stand our feet all over this congregation. Your heads are going to be bowed, your eyes are going to be closed, and I'm going to ask you to pray for your friends today. You may need to come to this altar. You may need me to come pray for them as a friend. You may need to come to me this morning and say, Brother Jim, I have not been that friend. I need to repent. What do I need to do? Father God, as we get ready to just come to the in humble obedience, it is my prayer today as the pastor of this church that we are never left with the excuse of so-and-so had a friend. We find ourselves faithfully doing what you call us to do. And that is, Lord, being the example worth following. And, Lord, if we have bad influences in our life, give us the strength we need to walk away from them. I ask you all in your name. As we stand on our feet, Ms. Manola is going to play. I'm giving everybody the opportunity to pray today. Stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. This altar is open. Your pastor is standing here. Oh, God's people said. This is a hard message because I know the subject matter that is at the back end of this that we really move through, but that wasn't the point today. I hope and pray that as God has led me to talk about it, and especially with it being the week that school starts, it was the right time. I've been sitting on this one, to be honest with you, from since word go because I'm going to tell you, your friends. And my friends influence us way more than we think they do. And if that's the case, and you see it coming, you better get off the tracks because the train ain't stopping. This is going to be a very important week for our young people. So now that the pastor knows exactly when they're going to camp, they're leaving this coming Saturday morning to go for three days to Panama City to a very safe place. He has 28 total people going. You'll see a few empty spots in here next weekend, and I'm excited for you guys. So, Brother Jordan, we're going to pray for y'all at the end of the service today. They need to be here Saturday morning. What time do you guys leave? 11, be here at 10.30. 11 o'clock, need to be here by 
10, 15, 10, 30 to get loaded up on the buses, on the caravan going to Panama City. We've got two very special young men that are going to come to lead. One of them you know, C.J. McLeod, who has led music in here for us before. He's coming to lead music for them. And the speaker, what is his name? Josh Dickens. Josh Dickens, uh, associate pastor in a church in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. And, when, uh, and he will be the speaker this weekend for our young people. They're going to have a great time, so I encourage you. And it's not too late if your child would like to go. Brother Jordan would love to have you. We'll figure it out. So um, we remind you of that. Thank you, too, also for those of you that have been faithful in giving during this time. There are several ways to do that. I remind you as you leave today, the offering plates are at each corner. You may do so online. But we thank you for your faithfulness during this time as we try to move forward. Uh, just looking around, there are a couple of churches that are today, the first day they've actually met together in six months. So we're very thankful and very blessed that God has allowed us the opportunity. So as long as you are able to come, for those of you that are still out there, we love you, Cam. But if you are still, we just thank you for your faithfulness to join us here. It's been a good week. We're, Wednesday night, we return. We return to our study, uh, Revelation chapter 5. So you want to be here? to be a part of that. To continue to our view in heaven. And as our young people and children meet together. Let's bow together and we'll be dismissed. And... Um, Brother Jordan, while you run and get the Sunday school material, which, and Miss Benita is going to help you, and if you want to pick that up, Miss Benita has those available for you right there behind you, Brother Jordan. You may pick those up on the corner of the platform on the stage. Let's bow together, and we will be dismissed today. Miss Jan Robertson, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer today, please? Great day, everybody.